Thank you, Mark. Uh, we now move on to our third panelist. Uh, she is Christiane Wilke. Uh, Christiane earned her degrees in political science at the New School of Social Research in 2005. She is on the faculty in the Department of Law and Legal Studies at Carleton University in Canada. Um, she has been the managing editor of the Canadian Journal of Law and Society. She has published in a variety of journals that are very much relevant to what we are talking about at this conference, including the Journal of Human Rights, among many others. She is currently completing a book manuscript on criminal trials, human rights, and political transitions in Argentina in Germany. And the title of her talk today is East of the Rule of Law. So we are interested to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. And where that is East of the Rule of Law. So you can take your guess. Um, so how is the rule of law understood, grounded, and mobilized in transitional trials? In this presentation, I will not talk about trials directly. Instead, I will trace the background discussion about an important limit and purpose of trials, the rule of law. Invocations of the rule of law, its virtues, and its limits are commonplace during many transitions. They also take place in the context of shaping social and professional identities through contrasts with others in the past and foreign others. I trace these discussions in two distinct and connected contexts, Germany after 1945 and Germany after 1989. I show that lawyers don't just apply a set of existing rules and principles that are called the rule of law, Rather, they invoke, fashion, and define the rule of law to respond to their specific needs. They construct the rule of law in relationship to its opposites, to lawlessness, to arbitrariness, to show tries, to excesses, and maybe surprisingly, justice. In German transitional justice, these opposites of the rule of law are imagined to be located in two more or less specific places, in the country's immediate past, and in other places, notably East Germany. In this discourse, East Germany takes on the traits of a mythical East that defies location. The German rule of law turns out to be, as my argument, a West German rule of law that has always been articulated against the backdrop of places that are before the rule of law or East of the rule of law. These processes of crafting rules and identities are context specific, but there are good reasons to believe that the identification of the rule of law with actually existing Western states also occurs in other places to which the rule of law is supposed to be expanded, taught, and exported, such as uh, wider Central and Eastern Europe, Africa, and Latin America. So we need to be careful about the assumptions and legal hierarchies that come with these attempts to civilize the wild east or south. I will briefly talk about what I call legal orientalism, and then focus on, on a very famous text by Gustav Radbruch about justice and the rule of law, and finally trace the discussions about the rule of law in uh, selected pieces in the East German Law Journal, New Justice. I've, I could talk about lots of things in, in larger patterns, but it's good, I think, to focus on uh, very few pieces. Um, I, will I will not only ask how the rule of law is defined, but also who gets to define it, um, what this rule of dema law demands from citizens and from judges, and which emotions and responses to the workings of law are authorized or expected. So law means different things in different contexts. In the European and North American tradition, law is often thought of as rooted in some things and qualities, such as nature, reason, God, civilization, or the state, and law is opposed to other things, such as emotions, morality, barbarism, and violence. So identifying law has be become a game of exalting law, of identifying it with the most virtuous characteristics one can imagine of one's own society. And legal principles express, um, my argument is, identities and aspirations. So these exercises of contrasting one's own society with others, in fact, have a long history. As Edward Said has shown, producing knowledge about others can be a way of establishing one's own self-identity through contrast with these others. What Said calls Orientalism is what he calls a Western style for dominating, restructuring, and having authority over the Orient. So uh, what and where is the Orient? For Said, the Orient is less of a physical place that you can find, find on a map than a projection of ideas, practices, and fears by Europeans. It is what Europe is not, and it is invariably less than Europe. In the German and wider European context, East and West indeed had meanings that were not simply cartographical, but cultural. 
The German East, for example, had become a place imbued with meanings and attributes that were borrowed by both classical Orientalism as well as the overlapping and more recent anti-communism. In German post-unification contexts, the old East German regime becomes the other against which the new and more Western state defines itself. These discourses of East and West, in turn, are foundational for understandings of law and its assumed place in the world. Law, as European jurists um, so-called discovered in the course of colonialism, is a thing of the West, their own thing, not of the East, of the South. So in their own tales, law becomes a marker of civilization, restraint, and rationality. Taking my cue from these cultural studies of law, I read pronouncements about law and the rule of law as statements about and performances of identities. I know that this is not the normal way of reading legal theory, um, nor is legal theory often thought of as a site of identity construction, but legal orientalism really begins at home in the dusty pages of law journals. So let's look at Gustav Radbruch. Um, he wrote one of the most famous texts on justice and the rule of law. Radbruch was a German jurist, politician, and legal philosopher. He was very much a legal positivist and, and a relativist. During the Weimar Republic, when he was also Minister of Justice, he strongly urged judges to not let the personal intuitions about justice get in the way of applying the law. Most German judges at the time were pretty hostile to the new republic, so their intuitions would be very nationalist. And in fact, they enabled the rise of, of the Nazis in the 1930s um, by rejecting legal positivism and putting the law in, in the service of the German nation understood in racial terms. In 1933, the Nazis removed Radbruch from his professorial position in Heidelberg. And in 1945, the Allies reinstated him. Since Rappel had impeccable credentials as a Democrat, he became a magnet and oracle for West German post-war lawyers. His views on the question of legal validity and retroactivity, which are the basis for the more practical question of which Nazi crimes can be prosecuted, became very influential. His article, um, Super Positive Law and Legislated Injustice, published in 1946, was his most famous contribution. It is probably among the most cited pieces of legal scholarship. But most references to this article focus on one short statement that I'm, I'm sure you know, known as Radbruch's formula. This is the following. The conflict between justice and legal certainty should be solved by privileging the positive law even when it is substantially unjust, unless the positive law is in such an unbearable conflict with justice that the positive law has become false law and thus has to yield to justice. So. Why have these sentences resonated so deeply? My argument is that we need to read the text not only for the legal arguments it proposes, but also for the identity constructions and narratives it fosters. Now, the majority of the post-war debate it reads Radbruch as somebody who tried to overcome the attachment to positivism, and they read the formula as suggesting that um, finally not everything that seems to be law needs to be respected as law. I want to suggest a different reading what he tried to do in this article is to rein in the use of natural law. I put the emphasis on the first part of his formula, the insistence that unjust laws need to be considered valid, and the second part, that, un that only unbearably unjust laws can be disregarded, is, uh, is a qualification of the principles set out in the first part. Um, but the fact is that the formula allows the society to claim a moral stance against mere positive law while not actually invalidating any positive laws, and I think that double move explains its popularity. Uh, when Radbo wrote the text, he was, a he was a relative outsider in the profession who had just been reinstated. So he opens the article with a statement that legal positivism, the idea that law is law and should not be questioned, rendered German Jews defenseless against the Nazis. That's how he's opening it. And the statement is really puzzling. There are two problems with it. One is, it's not true. The Nazi lawyers were not legal positivists, and the legal positivists didn't become Nazis, and the Nazis removed the legal positivists from their offices. Um, so second, and more importantly, Radbruch must have known that, because he had been a positivist, and he had never fallen for the Nazis, and it was only a year later. So really, why? So why? Um, by denouncing legal positivism, uh, Radbruch seemed to castigate himself, and he blamed an unpopular legal theory for the rights of the Nazi regime that most of his colleagues actually really supported, and not just tolerated, but supported. So in claiming intellectual responsibility for what his colleagues had in fact done, he offered them a precious gift. And they reciprocated by quoting his imperative mission of guilt in countless publications, which we all read. Um, so the text after this statement actually shifts focus, interestingly. It warns the same German judges not to be tempted by natural law. 
Scrat was skillfully appealed to his colleagues' identities. He interpolated them as responsible, moral, and moderate jurists, which they were clearly not. Um, he had achieved this by locating the problem of wild natural law justice in the East, in the Soviet occupied zone, or Russian zone, as he calls it. So he devotes much attention to a remark by an attorney general from an Eastern province, who, and that attorney general warned against clouding the facts with formalistic legal concerns in the pursuit of justice. This is exactly what Radbach wanted to actually guard against. So all the cases he discusses have three features in common. Um, first, they were decided in the Soviet occupied zone. Second, they invalidated the Nazi laws. And third, he was not comfortable with that, even when he finally agreed with the results. So he did not refer to a single case where he wanted to see more justice and less positive law. Against the backdrop of these cases, Radbach then develops um, his, what, what we know as his formula on the basis of, of defining justice. So for him, in the hierarchy of values, justice is the most important value, followed by legal certainty and then appropriateness. But then Rappu actually includes legal certainty in his definition of justice, so that justice and legal certainty become almost the same thing. Um, and then he moves on to make, um, to his formula that unjust laws have to be considered valid unless they're really unbearably unjust. So the identity building thrust of this argument is most apparent in the conclusion in which he shifts from the personal address of a lawyer to the embracing we of a citizen or politician. The we refers to West German jurists, but it was performative rather than descriptive. It tried to call into being a community it pretended to merely describe. So Repo enjoined his colleagues, he said, we are not of the opinion that has been articulated in Nordhausen that formalistic legal concerns can cloud the facts. Rather, we are of the opinion that after 12 years of denials of legal certainty, it is more important than ever to pay attention to formalistic considerations in order to guard against the temptations that are only understandable for those who have lived the 12 years of danger and repression. So in this appeal, Radboch characterizes the Nazi regime not primarily as unjust, but as unpredictable. The core legal values that Radboch saw violated and wanted reinstated were legal certainty and predictability. This is not the language of somebody who liberated German Jews from the confines of positivism, but of somebody who pretended to liberate his colleagues from positivism they had always rejected in order to temper their natural law inclinations. So if this text was the foundation for the West German rule of law, which I think is widely agreed, then the claim that legal positivism had made German Jews defenseless against the Nazis was the foundational lie of West German rule of law. The constitutive others of this rule of law are positivism, as well as unrestrained justice, and the Nazi state, as well as East Germany, which didn't even exist then. Uh, these strands of contrast resurfaced interestingly when the West German law was extended to East Germany after 1990. Imagining East Germany as Germans as east of the rule of law had profound effects. West German politicians and jurists determined the meaning of the rule of law, um, and East German critiques of legal practices in the context of unification were seen as evidence that those East Germans um, had not yet learned enough about the rule of law. They had not understood yet that the rule of law allows that only unbearably unjust laws be invalidated, and that all other injustices have to be borne with dignity and patience under the rule of law. So what did they do? In 1989, East Germans unraveled the regime that ruled them for 40 years. A year later, the East German state actually dissolved in unification. Um, starting in October, November 1989, you see a vast array of new political social organizations, concerns, and viewpoints had been seen for 40 years. Um, the legal profession was no exception, and I'm just really giving a glimpse of what happened. For example, in December 1989, the, the one and only East German law journal, New Justice, Neue Justiz in German, published a viewpoint of the Ministry of Justice on basic questions of the socialist rule of law, which is um, revolutionary because finally the Ministry of Justice uses the term rule of law modified by socialism, and it was hilarious to read as, like, as for example, the, the document uh, included suggestions for reform that politics needed to be guided by laws and bills may lo no longer be secret and must be discussed in parliament and those changes would be included in the 1991 to 1995 legislative plan. Yay. Um, so this official position paper was followed by increasingly more radical manifestos and demands from law faculties, the Bar Association, and Jews who had actually been dissidents. This was the beginning of a longer discussion and very diverse discussion about law and identities. Um, at the same time as this happened, the social and professional world of these contributors turned completely upside down. So the judges and prosecutors had to undergo training and screening for the suitability to apply West German law in unified Germany. 
So since unification had brought Western law to their lens, they were no longer experts in the law of the land. Um, most of them had to reapply for the jobs, and many left voluntarily and went into private practice or unrelated careers. So with these massive changes, who would actually read New Justice and who would publish in it in 1991, the governance of the journal shifted to a board of jurors, normally from both parts of Germany, but with a majority of West Germans. Um, the first editorial in April 1991 um, really sets the tone for the discussion to come. For editor Horst Sendler in 1991 was a new beginning, remembering the year 1947 when the journal was actually founded. So his declared goal was to fulfill the promise of 1947 that the journal may contribute to the establishment of a judicial system, as he says, worthy of the rule of law. In his narrative, the East German state was not a product of the reformist dreams of 1947, but simply their betrayal. Uh, East Germany was a detour from proper German statehood. For Zendler, East Germany was the rule of law's nightmare. It was an Unrechtsstaat, good luck translating that, um, a state not of the rule of law, but its opposite of injustice and lawlessness. The description of the East German states as an Unrechtsstaat um, was not based on a definition of Unrechtsstaat, but, but simply on the contrast with the rule of law, with the Rechtsstaat. Um, and also, Unrechtsstaat had not been a term for it to use for Nazi Germany um, before it became popular for referring, for using referring it to the East German state. So the confusion of unification apparently called for a fresh set of binaries um, to stabilize the legal and political hierarchies. The invocation of the Unrechtsstaat placing East Germany east of the rule of law allowed Zendler, for example, to disregard criticism from East Germans that they were treated as second-class citizens. Zendler responded to them that the transition from a fundamentally unjust system to the rule of law might be, quote unquote, unpleasant. And pretty mild for you know, mass unemployment and, um, and really second class citizen rules. In this logic, the law of unified Germany embodied the rule of law by definition. So whatever it did, even when it violated its own stated principles, such as equality. So East Germans were very welcome to complain about the past East German Unrechtsstaat, but not about the current East German Rechtsstaat, because that is embodiment of the rule of law. So such was the tone of a logic, and you remember of an editorial, that aimed to foster the rule of law um, and German unification through dialogue, which was not a dialogue. So the new editors thought of the country whose only law journal they had taken over simply as a contrast file for their own professional identities. Um, so during the 1990s that time, Gustav Radbruch gained many adherents, um, including the president of the Federal Supreme Court, Walter Odersky. So let me conclude by closing the circle and consider what made Radbruch such an appealing reference point in the 1990s. For Odersky, the uh, court president, Radbruch was the key authority on law morality. Drawing on Radbruch, Odersky found that a firm prohibition on retroactive judgment was, quote, at the core of the rule of law. So non-retroactivity becomes the core of what it's all about. And which uh, firmly correct laws would be invalidated? The answer for Radbruch in 46 and Odersky for 92 is not many at all. Um, so in invoking Radbruch, Odersky wanted to have it both ways. He liked the firmness of non-retroactivity and, and the security, but didn't want to be associated with an amoral pursuit of mere legality. So the appearance of morality in that the formula allows was as important as the appearance of firmness that, uh, that it also allowed. Now, Odersky drew his audience deeply into a landscape of moral emotions, of temptations and restraints. Um, the rule of law with its limits, he told his audience, must come as a disappointment. So yes, be disappointed. Many state crimes cannot be punished, which implicitly says that punishing them would be justice. So you should be disappointed that they can't be punished, therefore we can have justice. He invites his listeners to display civic and moral maturity by dealing with this disappointment, by restraining the, their desire for something else, something fantastic, something out of reach, in short, their desire for justice. So how are these emotions and identities tied up? In Odesky's own words, law is one of the most important barriers against the rise of extremist ideologies that want to subjugate people. Herein lies one of the most important values of the rule of law that we have to make clear, especially to our fellow citizens from the new provinces, that's East Germany. One of them, Belbe Bolay, is being quoted as having said, we want a justice, but we got the rule of law. I should make this more disappointing. Um, so we have, and he continues, we sh have to caution against pursuing immediate and complete justice in this world. If our search is not embedded in the rules of law, which are necessarily imperfect, it can easily turn into subjectivity and uncertainty about the law. So using Rappos' concepts and a fair dose of legal orientalism, Odesky voices concerns about moral immaturity 
and that immediately displaces the problem onto East Germans, not West Germans. I need East Germans are not even part of the we that he invokes, the we of the people who have to explain the rule of law to our fellow citizens from the new provinces. East Germans were still east of the rule of law, not yet willing to live with the restraints and disappointments that it brings, and not yet willing to give up on justice and on criticizing the rule of law for its inability to do justice. In some, since Red Bull's te seminal text written in 1946, the key to the German rule of law is that it's actually West German rule of law uh, developed against a wild east. Uh, the key of this rule of law is to exercise restraint, to live with unjust laws, unless they're really unbearably unjust, not to complain about the disappointment that is the rule of law. As a consequence, citizens were invited to celebrate transitional trials, also or especially when they did not bring real justice, because the rule of, um, for the rule of law that these trials must embody is much more precious than mere justice. So regardless of how we evaluate any single trial, um, I think it's important that to appreciate this context, um, these identity building foundations of the rule of law as they have been articulated in, in and exported in Germany, and because they've been so widely exported, I think it's not only a German problem. <laughs>